So I'm going to start with some very basic things about captives and then move on and talk a little bit more sophisticated things, give a particular example of a very successful captive in Lab 1, and then finish off by not repeating what we've heard a couple of times over the last day or so about Lab 1, but giving you a little bit of my personal experience there. And then I have um, asked, um, and I will ask for some questions um, to make sure that not everybody has fallen asleep. So in insurance, we like jargon, okay? This is the IAIS, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, the Regulators Club, their definition of captives. And I'd like to, I mean, I think it's worth going through this, but I'll, I'll distill it down in the next slide into some more accessible language. Please note three things here. It's an insurance or reinsurance entity, that, that, but it's owned directly or indirectly by an industrial, commercial, or financial entity. It provides cover, insurance or reinsurance cover, for the risk of that entity or entities. And in some jurisdictions, it writes a small amount of th what we call third-party business, i.e. unrelated to its owner. And that's fundamentally what a captive is. It's wholly owned, and it ensures the assets and liabilities and other risks of its parent. Typically located in a jurisdiction where tax, solvency, and reporting requirements are less onerous than where its parent is based. Quite often, there are, there's a whole industry of specialists like my own, but other managers and accountants and administrators that manage the affairs of the captive on behalf of its owner. All right. But, most importantly, clearly the parent is the one that decides how much risk that captive assumes and how much of it it then transfers onto other parties, reinsures itself. I think these numbers are out of date. Way more than 75% of Fortune 500 companies have their own captives these days. And we're talking billions of dollars of premium flowing through these 5,000, more than 5,000 captives worldwide. This is no longer alternative. This is mainstream risk management for large organizations. Thank you. I've never been very good at technology. Thanks, Joe. Okay, different types of captives. The one that most people know about and I've been really focused on to date is what we call pure captives. These are single parent companies. They only write the risks of their owner, a single owner or affiliate. Then there are group captives. Um, these are insurance companies, risk bearing entities that are owned by a group or an association. I suppose in the marine insurance business, those of you that are, get involved in that, one of the most famous examples of those are P&I clubs, the, the ship owners coming together and mutualizing risk together, and they fundamentally own collectively that insurance entity. There are what we call rental captives. Um, these are captives that are established, uh, facilities structured, established by a manager or a third party, and then, as the name implies, rented to the organization. An, an example, another sort of variant of a rental captive were what we call in Lab 1 protective cell captives, where uh, an administrator establishes a master cell and then rents out or, or lets people have access to subsidiary cells, which they then use as, as little mini captives, if you will. And then diversified captives. I've already talked about this before, where captives write third-party business. Insurance, after all, is all about diversification of risk. And it is sometimes argued that just assuming the risks of the owner of that captive leaves that captive with a very small risk base 
from which to diversify. One way of dealing with that, of course, is to write other business. Now, personally, I'm not a fan of this because the history of the captive business is littered by captives that have started writing businesses of other parties that they don't understand and have lost a lot of money on. Indeed, in Lab One, our captives are not allowed currently to write third-party business for that very reason. Okay, so that's what they are, but why would you have one in the first place? Now, most people, of course, go down to, to number five on the list first, tax. We've already mentioned how efficient Lab One is and most other domiciles are for tax reasons. I would, I mean, I'm quite strong in my views, as you may have noticed already, I would be quite strongly against anyone starting with establishing a captive for tax reasons. Clearly, there are some tax mitigation, tax efficiency benefits of having a captive, particularly depending upon where you domicile it. But fundamentally, it's a risk management tool. You've got to look at all of the risks that your organization, your entity, your association is exposed to, and then think about, once you understand those risks, the ones that you're happy to keep and the ones that you want to transfer or mitigate or manage in a different way. And it's only once you've gone through a thorough, what we these days call enterprise risk management process, should you start thinking about a risk management tool like this, and that's where it begins to play a role. If you're spending enough money on premium in a conventional sense, it may make sense for you to put some of that into a pooling entity, a captive, and manage the risks through that captive, and then indeed protect that pool of risk through reinsurance. Clearly, as I've already indicated, one of the great benefits of captives is, as a large organization, you start dealing directly with the global reinsurers, the big players in the market. You don't, you're not restricted to, quite in domestic markets, some domestic markets at least, where the domestic insurers are quite small insurance companies. Um, you're dealing with the big boys, you're negotiating directly with, quite often, the, the entity that is keeping the end risk it makes sense to be there talking to them. It can also be very useful if there's particularly difficult risks that your organization is exposed to, to put them into a captive. They may be uninsurable, but it may still make some sense to, to finance those risks if they materialize through some insurance mechanism. And clearly, if they're uninsurable in a conventional sense, the only way to insure them is to put them into your own insurance company and manage them within that risk. Um, customization, I've already mentioned that. And it really allows you to control the cover that you have and indeed to manage multinational programs across many different territories far more efficiently. How? Well. I've already said the first thing I really do believe you've got to do is think about, is this right for you? I mean, a lot of people get to a stage where they think they should have a captive and just go through the, a process of establishing a captive rather than thinking about how feasible that is. Is it really, does it really make sense from a cost-benefit analysis? And fundamentally, it comes down to the amount of losses, claims, things that go wrong within your business on a regular basis, on a year-to-year -year basis. If that happens very regularly, and rather than paying premium away to the conventional insurance market, collecting in claims year in, year out, it's a very expensive process. It's a very inefficient process. It's better to think about pooling that in your own insurance entity, those losses, paying those losses when they, as and when they arise, and indeed protecting the volatility in that pool of losses on a year-to-year -year basis through reinsurance. You've got to go to the regulator, the Lab 1 FSA or, or wherever that regulator is based, and apply for a captive license. You, it's still, a, in, in all domiciles, insurance is, is a regulated, and reinsurance is a regulated activity, and you will need to get licensed and not Sometimes not easy, you know, depending upon 
the kind of risks are talking about, how you go about the process, you need to do it properly. And this is where your captive manager, your administrator, comes in and plays a, a very big role. Clearly, you've got to establish the company and register that, either with a trust company or with a company registrar. And then we appoint a, a manager and an underwriting manager, some directors and company secretaries, who start writing business. What are the kind of practical issues you'll face immediately? Well, I've already said insurance and reinsurance is a licensed activity in Indonesia like everywhere else. When you buy insurance, you have to buy it from a locally licensed insurance company. If your captive is in Bermuda or Labuan, you can't buy it from there. So you have to buy the insurance from what we call a fronting company, a local insurance company, and then reinsure that risk from the local company to the, um, to the captive. Um, the regulator in Indonesia for the past year or so has focused very closely on the amount of reinsurance that is going from onshore Indonesia to offshore reinsurers and indeed captives. So um, you do need to make sure that you are in compliance with those rules. And typically they talk about the, um, the size of the asset base you're insuring, the, the size of the liabilities, and the fact that you have exhausted local capacity before you can go to Munich Re, Swiss Re, or your captive in Labuan. All right. Um, local insurance companies, once again in Indonesia, like many other countries, are regulated uh, by according to their risk-based capital these days. A very important component of risk-based capital in Indonesia, as everywhere else, is the amount of reinsurance you buy. And the amount of reinsurance you buy with a counterparty who doesn't have a rating or a lower than perfect rating. When you start your captive in Labuan, it will have no financial strength rating. So you are asking a domestic Indonesian insurance company to buy reinsurance from your unrated captive in Labuan, that has big, serious risk-based capital issues for that local insurance company. All of these issues, practical issues, we can deal with, but you need to be aware of them. Um, clearly, once you've got the captive, and I've, once again, I've mentioned this a number of times already, you've then got to protect that pool of risk you've put into the captive. You've got to buy reinsurance yourself. Reinsurance of reinsurance technically is called retrocession, but that's just more jargon, so excuse me. We can do that in a conventional one-year basis, what we call quota share, or excess of loss above a certain level, or, this is where I get excited, you can come to me and we start talking about structured programs. A benefit of having a captive is you can go directly to the reinsurance market, to the Munich Rees, the Swiss Rees, and negotiate with the big boys, the end carrier of your risk. But you can also place that reinsurance on a more structured, interesting, more economic, efficient basis. In insurance and reinsurance, we talk a lot about multi-year relationships, about from year to year building a relationship with our clients. But typically, most insurance is placed for one year and then renewed. And there's a big fight, negotiation, however you want to characterize it, every year in this long-term relationship to make sure that things run smoothly, particularly if you have some claims or the worldwide market suffered some loss and then suddenly you've got a very difficult negotiation. I like to write reinsurance and place reinsurance on a multi-year basis. Let's do it for three years. Let's do it for five years. I've done deals for 10 years where we commit to take a certain level of risk over a fixed period of time, irrespective of what happens to the losses, irrespective of what happens to the international reinsurance and insurance markets. If there is some major disaster in California, in Europe, it doesn't affect your program. That's one of the things I like to do, is think about 
multi-year multi -year programs that spread loss over time, but also include significant amounts of risk transfer. We can also um, incorporate uh, levels of what we call aggregate deductible over and above an amount of risk that you are happy to retain in your program. We build that in to essentially to save money, but in another sense, you can think of it as a form of additional equity capital for your captive. Ultimately, you've got to put some capital into your captive for the risks it's retaining. But one of the challenges in most organizations is that capital is expensive. You want it for your core business. This captive, after all, is only a subsidiary risk pooling entity. It isn't your core business. You're in some other industry or financial services or whatever. So, and you need most of your capital in that core business. So the opportunity cost of putting capital into your captive is very high. These kind of programs where we supplement over several years the amount of risk you're willing to assume relative to your capital is another form of capital, quasi-capital, in your captive. We also like to write reinsurance across several lines of business. Okay? Typically, we buy insurance as organizations on what we call a monoline basis. We go out and buy a property program. We go out and buy a liability program. We go and buy a marine program if we have cargo or hull exposures. We hand away all of that non-correlation of risk to the insurance industry. Okay? I think we believe that a more interesting way of, buy, of placing risk is to pool lots of non-correlated or uncorrelated risk together and then reinsure or insure the aggregate volatility in that retained basket. Okay? So we will write property, liability, specialty risks all within one single policy, what we call multi-line. Okay? And we will say, you retain the first 10 million of losses, be they from property, liability, marine, DNO, ENO, whatever you put into your captive, you retain the first 10 million. And then over and above that, we'll pay the next $50 million of losses. Okay? And that way, we are, can be more capital efficient, you capture some of that economic benefit of lack of correlation in those risks. I hope I'm being vaguely clear. When it gets really exciting is when we do multi-line, multi-year policies. So we put together a basket of risks, uncorrelated risks, and we agree to reinsure you over three or five years. That's the kind of business that you can do with your captive when you have one. Let's talk about having one. Petronas is the national oil company of Malaysia. Um, between 1997 and 2004, it spent 1.3 billion ringgit in premium and received backing claims from its insurers only 460 million ringgit. A loss ratio claims to premium of 35%. It is by far the largest oil and gas company in Malaysia. There are some smaller ones, but certainly back in those days, it was probably the only one. And therefore, in the Malaysian insurance market, it was pretty unique. Um, a lot of its insurance risk ultimately was reinsured abroad and came to London and the other major reinsurance centers, the kind of risk that I used to place. A significant amount of premium going overseas from Malaysia, um, and indeed a lack of, there wasn't any accumulation of knowledge and expertise within Malaysia of these kind of risks. Furthermore, you should know that historically the oil and gas market, the energy insurance market, has been incredibly volatile. You know, we have had major losses in the North Sea, Piper Bravo. We've had huge losses in the Gulf of Mexico. And every time we have a major loss on one of these offshore platforms, the following year, insurance premiums go up sometimes two or threefold, even if you're not involved, okay? because it is a very lumpy kind of business. And that was the experience that Petronas had had. They set up a wholly owned subsidiary in 2005 
and started underwriting in 2006 with only $10 million of US dollars of capital. I'm pleased to say that they stuck to their own risks. It's a single parent captive, but it wrote um, a share of Petronas's risk across the world. Petronas isn't only just active in Malaysia, it has interests in many offshore concessions around the world. It's, it's, a, it's a significant medium-sized oil and gas company. Um, they have only taken their share in the various um, offshore developments and they have kept what I was talking about earlier, the first few million dollars of risk. They haven't written that unrelated third-party business. They don't get involved in some of the more complex risks that they're exposed to. For instance, long-tail liability, uh, construction risks, which can be five, seven years in duration, highly complex, significant amount of claims. So they've kept it simple. I'm pleased to say one of the other things that they have done is gone and get a rating from the uh, rating agency, AM Best. AM Best, for those of you who don't know, is the insurance specialist rating agency. You will have heard of a Standard & Poor's and Moody's and maybe Fitch, but um, AM Best is the only rating agency, it's based in New Jersey, um, that focuses on the insurance and reinsurance industry. And very early on, Enagas decided that they were going to get a rating. Um, it's a pretty good rating, I can tell you. A, a excellent is significantly better than many of their reinsurers, which is quite an interesting sort of concept if you think about it. They've had it just recently reaffirmed in, in March 2015. It has been a great success for Petronas. Having this rating, of course, addresses that one of those practical issues I mentioned earlier, so that if they are reinsuring a domestic insurance company, they then, the domestic insurance company doesn't have the capital issues associated with buying reinsurance for an unrated captive. It's a bit of a technical issue, but it is, I'm pleased to say, something that Petronas or Enagas, the name of the captive is addressed, it's been a great success. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very good case study. There is more information in the public domain if anyone is interested. And um, I think it's worth sort of following that through as a, as a good case study. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, let me talk finally about my experience of Lab One um, because I hope it's pertinent and of interest. You've heard a lot about Lab One, those of you who were at the dinner last night and, and, and already this morning. But I came to, to Singapore in 2003 to head up the Lloyd's Market presence in Asia Pacific. For those of you who are in the insurance business, in those days there were only two syndicates in Lloyd's in Singapore. There are now 20 of the London-based Lloyd's syndicates active in, in the Singapore market, Lloyd's Asia. But one of the other things we started doing, apart from building Lloyd's in Asia, in, through Singapore was we looked at the other markets and domiciles around Southeast Asia and we focused on Lab One pretty early on. And we found um, a, a manager, I mentioned it earlier, we found a manager that we liked and that we were very comfortable with and started discussions with, with Daniel and others at, uh, at Lab One FSA in those days about getting Lloyd's a license. Now to be honest, with all due respect Daniel, when you come in the door with your Lloyd's card, Lloyd's of London, you get a good reception. Okay, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's a joy, it's a privilege, okay, to represent a 300-year-old institution. And many regulators are interested in talking to you about coming to their, 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 their market, okay. And, and we did, and we created Lloyd's in Lab One, and now a number of the Lloyd syndicates that are in Singapore are also in Lab One. And indeed, there's probably a next phase of Lloyd's in Malaysia under discussion at the moment. If you wind that clock forward now, um, gosh, 2003 to 2012, I went back to Lab One, to the Lab One FSA, with an SME, my own entity. 
And of course, I expected a rather different response because I didn't have Lloyd's on my name card. I just had Huntington Underwriting on my name card. And we were going to try and do, and we are doing, some very interesting and novel things, as I hope I've given you a flavor of. But fundamentally, what I can assure you is that the reception was exactly the same. Uh, we actually dealt with the same manager. That maybe helped. Um, but we went to the Labuan Office and we, just, we gave them our plan and they said, great, please go and get on with it. And it was a very uh, well-orchestrated, well-defined process. And the, 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 the rest is history. Um, but it is, I think, just as important, I think, when we talk about Lab One, to talk about it as a very good place to start new ventures, as much as it is to, to welcome the Lloyds of London or the Barclays that we spoke about earlier. It, is, it does have this infrastructure, this infrastructure that allows you to, to go to Lab One to establish an operation and really get on with the business itself. Because all of the, the, the back office, all of the, the, the important um, filing, regulatory, accounting uh, requirements at the back office are very easily handled. It works tremendously well. And so you, when you go to Lab One, as either Lloyd's or Huntington Underwriting or whatever Indonesian uh, captive you choose to establish, you can get on with doing your business. And to my mind, that, um, that very flexible but um, business-friendly environment is essential when you're starting a new business, be it your own or your organization's captive. You need to get on with the business that you're there to do rather than worry about a lot of paperwork with the regulator um, and all other back office administration. It is also, I have to tell you, surprisingly inexpensive. Um, now, okay, I spend some of my time doing business in Singapore. I also spend some of my time doing business in Pakistan, where we have another business, all right? Um, it's somewhere in, the, in between those two as a cost destination, but it's certainly much closer to Pakistan than it is to Singapore. Um, so I thoroughly recommend it, and I would suggest that you will get the same kind of reception as, as we have done over the last 10 to 15 years. As I said at the start, I'm not a captive manager, but what I've tried to do is give you a little bit of benefit of, of my experience of, of what captives are, why people have captives, and, and how captives uh, come about, what you do, and some of the kind of things that you can do with those captives. The Anagas example, I think, is, is a great one. Um, and I think, there's, as I said, it's worthy of some more research if, you, if you're interested in, in, particularly in an oil and gas or energy-related captive. And furthermore, I mean, I, I am privileged to be here on behalf of Lab One uh, to, to talk about it. But it's also um, a joy as well, because so far, at least, touch wood, um, we've had a great experience together. and. Um, I'd be delighted to answer any questions you have about captives, insurance or reinsurance, um, and indeed Lab One itself. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Yes. Tony, just want to ask you. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I wanted to ask you, what's your experience about Lloyd's and captive insurance? How has the 300 years history of Lloyd's supported or developed captives? Uh, and I think Lloyd's has dealt with captives in the same way as Munich Re and Swiss Re deal with captives. Those oil company captives that I was mentioning of BP and Shell probably place a bigger share still today of their reinsurance into the Lloyd's market than they do with either Munich Re or Swiss Re or any of the other major reinsurers. So that's the first answer to your question. Lloyd's is, is just a major reinsurer and deals with captives in the same way as everybody else. It's a typical intermediary for risk. Lloyd's has toyed with captive syndicates. Okay. Now, I, my understanding is today that 
that's no longer allowed. But they did at one stage turn around to large organizations and said, rather than set your captive up in Lab One, come to Lloyd's and have your own syndicate. Now, that's quite an interesting proposition because the minute you've got a Lloyd's syndicate from day one, you get all of the Lloyd's ratings. So the issues I was talking about, about ratings and counterparty risk and all of that kind of thing, they go away. Um, there were a couple of major, well, one petrochemical company I know about and a couple of others that were interested. I don't know how far it got, um, but I haven't heard anything about it for maybe 15 years. So I suspect that there really wasn't the take up that uh, Lloyd's had hoped when they originally thought about that. Sir. Uh, clarification, what is a uh, Lloyd syndication? Means? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Um, jargon, more jargon. Uh, Lloyd's is not an insurance company, okay? That's the first thing everybody needs to, that is, doesn't, isn't aware should know. Lloyd's is an insurance market, okay? So it's like a fruit and veg market, a fish market, and you go and buy not fruit and veg or fish, but you go and buy um, a from the different participants in the market. Now, those participants in the market are called, called syndicates. And in the old days, they were syndicates of individuals coming together and, and sharing in the risk. And famously, those names, those investors in the syndicates, were, had unlimited liability down to their last cufflink. You know, if you invest in the shares of an insurance company, a reinsurance company, or indeed any other company l quoted on a stock exchange, your liability is limited to the amount you invest, the amount you pay for the share. The share can go from 10 rupiah to zero, but they can't come for you anymore. But in Lloyd's, you p had to put up some money, and if that ran out, you had to put up some more money and you had to continue to meet your liabilities. So those were the names. Today, most Lloyd syndicates are backed by large insurance companies and reinsurance companies with limited liability. Okay, sorry. But fundamentally, a syndicate is one of these mini insurance companies at Lloyd's that, is, that trades in the market. There are about 80 today, 20 of which are in Singapore, about 10 of which are in Labuan, 10, 10. Um, yes, I hope that answers your question, sir. We'll be right with you, madam. Um, hi, Tony. I've got two questions. Um, there are currently about 40 captives in Lab 1. Um, when they were first developed, um, the insurance markets were not very happy in Malaysia because they saw the premiums leaving Malaysia into the captives in Lab 1. So they felt they're going to lose a client, they're going to lose premiums. So how would you handle this question? Um, if a large client says to the insurer, uh, I pay a lot of premium, I don't collect any claims, so I want to set up a captives. Um, so if you were an insurer, how would you say, how would you handle this question when one of your beloved clients says, I want to set up a captives, and you, you're sort of worried about losing all these premiums? How would you handle that question? Faris, thank you. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, business is business, all right? Um, if you, as an Indonesian insurance company, find a very large client establishing a captive, my sincere advice is to work with that client and recognize that the insurance needs of that client are going to be handled differently in future and you can either be part of it or you can lose the business entirely. It's a fact of life. You know, captives are not going away. They are, as I've tried to explain, a very basic risk management tool today for many of the largest corporations. By the way, also here in Indonesia, there are an, uh, a significant number of um, captives owned by large organizations and, and companies here in Indonesia. And if a client of yours talks decides to go down the captive route, I think you have to work with that client and you have to work out how to assist that client, 
retain as much of the risk and the premium as you can, but, um, but also help them with the reinsurance into the captive and any other sort of matters that they, that they need. At the end of the day, insurance is a service industry. We've got to provide service. If a client wants to do something, we've got to work out how to work with them to, to, to facilitate that. Uh, thanks. Right. That makes sense. Th thank you, uh, Tony. The second question: um, A client rings you and says, "Right, I'm a bi I'm a big group, and I have a new factory in Korea, and the the Korean law says that you got to buy insurance from the local market." Um, and then you say, "Right, I want the Korean insurer to insure the risk, but I want 95% of the risk to come to my captive in Labuan, um, but the local Korean insurer." will not follow instructions because the captive doesn't have a rating and the Korean insurance company uh, cannot reinsure with somebody without a rating. So how can the client get around this, this problem? Well, I, I think the first, Varys, thank you again for your second question. The first question is you've got, clearly got to find a very good reinsurance broker like Faris. Um <laughs> There are a number of ways of dealing with a lack of rating for a captive. Um, one way uh, that um, we have used in the past is, I've already mentioned that captives themselves buy reinsurance, typically from the Munich Rees, the Lloyds, the, the Swiss Rees of this world. So you have a, a sort of a trail of risk from local insurance company to captive to reinsurer. And the problem is that the captive doesn't have a rating. But both the insurer and the reinsurer both have a rating. One way to, to deal with that is to, put, is to swap the position in the risk chain of the captive and the reinsurer. So essentially, the Korean insurance company in this example, Faris, reinsures to Hanover Re, and then Hanover Re seeds the residue of the risk that the captive, when it was intermediating was happy to assume back to the captive, but, but keeps the risk and provides 100% policy to the Korean insurance company. So the Korean insurance company is buying reinsurance from 100% reinsurance from or 95% from a rated entity. It has no excuse but to say yes. There then has to be some comfort given to, if it's Hanover Re, that if the captive has to pay claims, it has the resources to do so. Ways to deal with that would be in the order of a parental guarantee um, or indeed some other form of collateralization. But that's just one way that uh, we've dealt with that kind of situation in the past. But clearly the broker has a very important role, Faris. You did want me to say that, didn't you? Thank you. Right, the Madam in blue. Thank you. I am Wati from Aparindo. I would like to have your uh, opinion in regards of captive company. As we all understood that the captive um, purpose certainly based on the benefit of the members of the captive. In this case, how is your opinion about? You know that broker, insurance broker, their um, client is the insured policy uh, buyer. And for reinsurance broking company, their um, client is shooting company. In this case, if the insurance broker is member of captive among them with shooting company and reinsurance broker member of captive with the uh, reinsurers, uh, how do you think about that? Because this is a conflict of interest between them. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for your question. I mean, my, my first sort of comment is conflicts of interest occur in our daily lives all the time. We can't get away from conflicts of interest. It's how you manage those conflicts of interest, and it's quite often down to personal integrity and organizational culture. So uh, I think we have to recognize that business, commerce, is full 
of conflicts of interest. Now, I do agree 100% with you that the broking business in particular, and indeed the reinsurance broking business, has particular conflicts of interest that have um, alarmed, worried, caught the attention of regulators over the last 10 or 20 years. I mean, the most high-profile examples have been in New York State uh, with Elliot Spitzer going after the major brokers and contingent commissions. Um, what you're talking about here, and I'm not sure I fully understand exactly the relationship of the parties, but, but I think I know enough from what you've said to assume that clearly the insurance broker and the reinsurance broker have conflicts of interest. Okay? The first thing that must happen is total transparency so that all of the parties involved in the transaction, the original insured, the local insurance company, and whoever else is involved here, fully understands exactly who's playing what role, and ideally, what they're being paid for it, okay? And how they are being compensated, so that their motivations are entirely clear and, and transparent, as I said. Conflicts of interest will happen wherever we go, whatever we do, in our fact of life. Broking has a more complex environment because fundamentally they're, at least under English law, the agent of the insured, but they are paid by the insurance company. The commission is set by the insurer. That immediately is a fundamental uh, conflict of interest. The, the example you raise, I think, has, has additional layers of conflict. Uh, and as I said, the, the, the most sensible way to deal with it is just total transparency. And transparency in terms of remuneration in particular. Sorry. Thank you. In this case, we all understood that the, the um, answer is indeed we should do professionalism. But what I would like to know is, according to your experience, according to your experience, is there any problem in this case because of this conflict of interest? That first. And the, the second is, um, uh, you are talking about commission. That insurance broker, uh, the, as well as reinsurance broker, their commission paid by shipping company and reinsurance. According to your experience, is, the, is that any uh, um, country which is mentioned that insurance broker commission paid by the insured? And reinsurance broker paid by seeding company. How is your opinion or how is about your experience? Thank you. Thank you uh, again for your question. Um, once again, I'm not entirely clear that I understand all of the circumstances, but, but clearly there are problems with conflicts of interest. You know, it's just, um, it's just, as I said, conflicts of interest are a fact of daily life, and they raise certain issues and potential problems, potential problems. But they don't have to be real problems. It's for all the parties deal with them adequately, transparently, and as you said, professionally. All right. So I think that's the first question. The second question is, um, is the insurance broker remunerated by the insurance company? and the reinsurance broker remunerated by the reinsurance company? In theory, yes. Uh, a couple of clarifications, though. Firstly, quite often these days, with the very large brokers, the broker and the reinsurance broker are part of the same organization. Um, and the large brokers, I would, if I were them, like to take as many cuts of the cake as they possibly can. But sometimes, though, the, um, the total amount of commission to one party gets excessive. And it's unreasonable given the amount of service that is being provided. Hence the need for total transparency, particularly, as I said, if the broker and the reinsurance broker are part of the same big group. Fundamentally, what happens in practice with the big oil companies the insurance broker and the reinsurance broker are part of the same organization, and they rebate all of the commission to the client, all of it, 
total transparency, total rebate. They will bid for a fee to manage a another oil company's program, insurance, reinsurance, captive, everything, a whole suite of services according to a fee that is negotiated on an annual or a three-year, five-year basis. To my mind, that cuts out many conflicts of interest. It is clearly totally transparent, and it avoids a lot of the problems, potential problems, and clear conflicts of interest that arise otherwise. Not, I mean, there are arguments against fee-based business, but the practice with many large organizations is exactly what, as I have described. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions or one final question? In your case study, you actually put down Petronas that is paying 1.3 billion premium. But I am a small company so what's our threshold am I going to look into if I want to sell a captive? Sue, thank you for your question. You're not a small company. You're a very large organization. <laughs> <laughs> um, seriously, what, that's an incredibly good question because I've spoken about getting to a certain size or the level of premium or claims. So come on, Tony, what is the minimum at which you ought to think about these things? Um, I think that you should be spending about a million dollars, US dollars equivalent, a year in terms of premium to begin to think about your own fully-fledged standalone captive. There are examples of smaller ones, and there are structures which are similar to standalone captives. I mentioned rental captives and protected cell captives. Those are lower cost structures designed for smaller organizations spending less than a million dollars or incurring a million dollars of claims. But typically, in terms of a standalone captive, Sue, I think that we should start around that level. All right? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for the insightful presentation on captives and the reasons why we, especially the huge conglomerates, need to consider structuring a captive to better manage their risks and more essentially manage it in a more cost-efficient manner. Now, Anthony did stress that it's not for the purpose of tax reasons, yeah? So please bear that in mind. Again, once again, Tony, thank you for your wonderful presentation for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.